Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Caitlin Rubin, Interim Curator of Exhibitions at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Thank you for joining us for today's opening program for A Female Landscape and the Abstract Gesture. Organized by visiting curator Chastity Weinstock, this exhibition brings together works by four artists, Marin Hassinger, Howardina Pindell, Liliana Porter, and Mildred Thompson, who developed innovative abstract languages and vocabularies in the 1960s and 70s. In times of social rupture, they forged their own way through novel artistic gestures. By nailing, folding, unraveling, piercing, and fastening, these artists underscored the labor inherent in their art making, creating works that highlighted the body by revealing the actions through which they were crafted. The exhibition, A Female Landscape and the Abstract Gesture, opens today and will remain on view in the Johnson Kulikundas Family Gallery at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute in Cambridge through June 22nd. I very much encourage you to visit in person. For further information about the gallery location and hours, please visit the Radcliffe website at radcliffe.harvard.edu. This afternoon, you will hear first from the exhibition's curator, Chastity Weinstock, who will share images of works presented in the gallery and provide an overview of the artists and the research she has undertaken to bring together the show. A female landscape and the abstract gesture extends from Chastity's doctoral work at Harvard, where she is currently completing her PhD in the Department of History of Art and Architecture. Following her presentation, Chastity will be joined by art historian and independent curator, Mary Schneider Enriquez, formerly the Houghton Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. You can read more about both of today's speakers through the links provided on the event's webpage. We invite you also to submit your questions for Chastity and Mary throughout the program, as we will leave some time to answer these towards the end of our hour together. As Chastity will soon show you, the artworks featured in her exhibition foreground their connection points, their material fastening, and with this, the physical actions undertaken by the artists who brought them together. In this light, especially, I must make note of the person I am filling in for today, Meg Rotzel, curator of exhibitions at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. It is thanks to Meg's connection making that we are fortunate enough to have Chastity's curatorial work on view in our galleries. We are all very grateful for Meg's work to foster this opportunity and her stewardship of this project and its people. I also wanna take a moment to thank members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and our annual donors who generously keep Radcliffe programming free and open to the public. We also want to gratefully acknowledge the Johnson Kulakundas Family Endowment Fund for the Arts, which is supporting this exhibition. Finally, keep your eye on the chat feature of today's webinar or visit radcliffe.harvard.edu for information about coming events that will further explore the exhibition, including a curator tour tomorrow, an in-person public event with the artist Marin Hassinger on March 7th, and another virtual program on April 18th. And with that, it is now my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Chastity Weinstock. Good afternoon, everyone. In 2019, I received an email from a colleague, Kayla Jackson, now a PhD candidate in the History of Art and Architecture Department. We had spoken briefly over the phone and she knew I was conducting research on the work of Mildred Thompson. She forwarded me a couple of pieces of correspondence between Thompson and the writer, poet, and activist Audre Lorde from the Spelman College archives. And not long after this correspondence with Kayla, I reached out to Spelman College archivist Holly Smith, who sent me images of a female landscape, the work from which this exhibition takes its name. Tucked away safely in an archival storage box, the accordion fold book is now an archival document amongst many others in the Lore collection. Like the many pages of letters historians mine for information on their subjects, the accordion book has been vital to my research, helping me justify my findings with respect to Thompson's contributions to art history. Pen to paper, telling a story, communicating an idea, mailed from one place to another, much like a letter. It contains a wealth of information about her practice and methodologies. The Accordion Fold book is also a work of art. And in addition to being a work of art, it was also a gift distinguishing itself from some other works of art as an object meant to be manipulated, unfolded, then folded back again 
requiring, actually demanding a direct haptic experience. In this way, it's like Leisha Clark's critters. In the appeal to the optic and the haptic, it also shares important characteristics with personal letters. But make no mistake, this document, this book of drawings is also meant to be a work of art, making a distinct visual formal statement. With its sinu sinuous lines and repetitive hatch marks, Thompson showcases her facility in making the mark, in carefully maintaining a tension between figuration and abstraction, a determinative juxtaposition, an obvious one meant to make the viewer appreciate the abstract statement, while crucially also being reminded of the body, the body represented, and also with its insistent marks, the laboring body that made it. Thompson began to make what have come to be known collectively as wood pictures in the early 1960s while living in New York City. Over the course of their development, development, these works took on many forms, a variety of sizes. Some are painted a monochromatic white. Some have areas with shocking colors. After graduating from Howard University and completing further training in Germany and New York City, Thompson decided to move permanently to the city to begin her career. The racism she experienced and witnessed in the collective and in the personal led her to relocate to Germany, where she lived for many years in Duren from the mid 1960s through the 1970s. After spending that time in Germany, distancing herself from the racism she experienced in the United States, Thompson returned to Florida in 1974, where she made many of the works that are represented in this exhibition. These works maintain elements of the specific and the formal. For example, according to letters in the Spelman archives sent to Lord, many of Thompson's sculptural works from this period were constructed from Florida spruce, provided, the city, provided by the city of Tampa, the host of Thompson's artist's residency from 1974 to 1977-78. The works that are a part of this exhibition are emblematic of her production of wood pictures during this moment. And here again, like in a female landscape, we see a profusion of lines. Only in this case, the lines are distinctly different and in many ways much more difficult to make. And in these wood pictures, in part because of their minimal monochromatic makeup, they allow for a more direct and engaged focus on the method of their making, the repetitive nailing. Thompson leaves the driven nails as a prominent part of the composition, traces of the method of their making and the method of its fastening and attachment. In these somewhat unconventional repetitive gestures, the use of novel gestures and materials to make lines, Thompson highlights the labor and thereby points to the body. The monochromatic works from this period take many forms. These following slides are further examples that will be on view in the exhibition. A female landscape and the whip pictures collectively are works made up of these gestures repeated insistently. And they are both works of abstraction and works that refuse to completely relinquish the body. I first saw Thompson's wood pictures in a catalog accompanying the exhibition Magnetic Fields, Expanding American Abstraction, 1960s to Today. Like the current exhibition, that exhibition was in part the curator's effort to highlight the contributions of African-American women artists working in abstraction, contributions that until very recently have been largely overlooked. By the time I came across this work, as a researcher, I had been looking for artists who had contended with the contested loose ends of abstraction in the late 1960s and, 19, and early 1970s. I'd identified Howardina Pendel and Marin Hassinger as artists committed to finding a way through, thinking about rich theoretical ideas around fastening and attachment. These artists and their production from the time provided important case studies. And I am thankful to the work of so many who have worked to bring their work to a wider audience, including but not limited to Lowry Stokes Sims, Kelly Jones, and Sarah Cowan. 
The ways that these thinkers have situated the work has been tremendously important to my questioning and research. I am excited to bring this to Radcliffe this body of work. Mildred Thompson has been quoted as saying, the working together of the mind, the eye, the hand, and the controlled freedom of exploring and expressing through line is always an interesting and challenging phenomenon. While in this exhibition, I am very interested in thinking about the ways that these artists materialize the line. Mildred Thompson was born in Jacksonville, Florida in 1936 into a large middle-class African-American family. Her father was a pharmacist and her mother a school teacher. Imagine my surprise to find an African-American woman artist working in the time period that I was focused on, as obsessed with abstraction as I am, and from Jacksonville, Florida. Thompson, born in 1936, again, my was just three years younger than my grandmother who was born in 1933 and her sister born just a few years later. All three women attended Stanton High School. And I can imagine these young women walking those halls, perhaps in the same space and time, their lungs breathing the same air, their skin absorbing the same sun, their eyes seeing the same things. Finding a female landscape at the time that I did was crucial. Thompson completed this work at the same time that she was continuing to work in pretty radical, non-objective ways, radically non-objective ways. She was committed to a practice rooted in abstraction from early on in her career. While attending Howard University in the 1950s, she developed a pivotal mentoring relationship with the eminent artist and art historian, James Porter. Porter saw to it that Thompson was given a studio to work in and although his artistic output was dominated by representational art, throughout Thompson's early career, Porter encouraged her to continue to work in abstraction. But she never forgot the sinuous body. At crucial times in her practice, this fact was more apparent than at other times. But what I came to realize is that I think it was always there in the novel gestures, nailing into striking materials with a certain kind of specificity would and the driven nails being so adamantly highlighted in the specific labor, and again, pointing to the laboring subject, the laboring body. The large scale drawing, a female landscape, the length of a body meant to be lovingly handled and manipulated, reminding, reminded me that for many artists of this period, in the wake of the reverberations of high modernist abstraction, there were those who refused to relinquish the body, its trace on the face of the work, that it was important to set up generative juxtapositions between works that appeal to the optic and the haptic, holding subtle tension between the strictly figurative and the strictly, strictly abstract and between image and object. I saw Thompson's moves like those of Sam Gilliam and Al Loving made by forming their lines out of folds and stitches using quote, real space, Thompson expanded the world of her two-dimensional image, pushing out into the viewer space to explode the tactile possibilities. The interstices between the wood pieces from the undoubtedly strong lines that dominate the, form the undoubtedly strong lines that dominate the compositions. The rhyming of the gaps between the wood pieces and the natural lines in the wood must have surely been of tremendous importance to Thompson. The statement that these works make as exemplary of linear compositional qualities, merging both that which presents itself as an obdurate material and that which has been forced into a compositional statement by the artist. Thompson is making a statement by using this material and these methods to make a work that addresses the viewer like a painting on the wall. Other works show her using materials such as watercolor to layer in ways that show a correspondence to the, two, to the three dimensionality in wood pictures, such as in this work, Woodwork Five from 1974. Likewise, Howardina Pendel's early drawings from the 1970s are case studies in her innovative work of the period. 
Pindell developed these works while working as a curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I again was drawn to the work because of the strong juxtapositions. It was so clearly also two things at once, both image and object. The works made strong monochromatic two-dimensional statements. However, upon closer inspection, they radiated with the evidence of their construction. In an emphatic, yet somehow also subtle refusal to recede, the hole punch chads protrude from the surface and the glue asserts its own presence. The fastener, once again, like the nails in Thompson's compositions, becomes a distinct compositional element, one hard to ignore when a viewer moves in closer. Almost a decade ago, in 2014, Liliana Porter recreated a work from 1969 at the MFA Boston. In the quote, mural of silhouettes, Porter painted the shadows of people connected to the MFA. At first, for me, it was just pure delight to approach this work and realize that my quote, real shadow was mingling with the painted shadows. Here was a work of art that also occupied two distinct conceptual spaces, it was a painted, static, monochromatic, and abstracted image, but also a shifting installation piece, one ultimately activated by the viewer and one that created a distinct situation, one where the viewer had to pay attention to their body and space. Her prints from the late 1960s and early 1970s create a similar kind of situation for the viewer. The interplay of two-dimensional images created from traditional created from a variety of types of traditional types of printmaking and real shadows. The presence of the quote, real shadow heightens the Trumploy situation, momentarily fooling the eye and making it attractive to think about reaching out and touching it. Although these works are certainly images, they also appeal to our sense of touch and the working together of the eye and the hand. You'll see in Stitch that Liliana Porter has actually pierced the paper here and pulled through a tiny bit of yarn at the end. The shadows cast by hook remind the viewer that this line is not one that is made of ink or graphite, but yet one made of string that creates the same kind of interaction with the paper that our bodies might. Similarly, Marin Hassinger is both using a material more obviously associated with common work or labor, such as nails, strings, yarn, paper chads. And she is using a deliberately rather restrained method to make her works, the unraveling, of industrial wire rope. Like many of the materials in these artists' um, practices, the wire rope is one that Hassinger first found in a junkyard in Los Angeles in a specific place, in a specific time, at a specific moment in her practice. She was very intrigued by the fact that it could be bent and welded. And it was also something that could be manipulated with the hand. At the time she was investigating the liminality between fiber and materials that had more structural integrity on their own. And this is an important aspect of many of what the themes that are running through um, these works um, show. Like the Wood and Thompson's Wood Pictures, many of the later works com comprise the Florida sp spruce in Thompson's Wood Pictures, the Manila paper in Pendel's early drawings, collage works, the yarn in Porter's work, and, the, and its textile association, associations, and Hassinger's wire rope, 
in its universal linear statements, but those that are also tied to place. Um, we see that these artists are using materials that are novel, using them in novel ways to always point back to the laboring body and that laboring subject. As with any historical exhibition, I am eager to show these works, these primary sources. They are of paramount importance in providing evidence in support of my thesis. But I am also hoping that the bringing together of these works prompts consideration of a particular history of abstraction. And at times, efforts that have seemed like they evacuate the body. I'm interested in the ways that these artists contend with those attendant problematics, what I've been calling the loose ends of abstraction. I contend that they do this by materializing the line. But I also want viewers to have the experience of looking across media at these artists, the way that they are registering these simple manipulation of materials very deceptively, very subtly across media. And so with pleasure, I'm presenting two works by Marin Hassinger, two print works. And I'm hoping that that viewers will have the experience of pausing, taking the time to closely look and see the ways in which these artists are registering these gestures. I'd like to take a chance now to again thank Meg Rotzel. Without Meg, this position would not have been available to me to be able to bring this exhibition to the Johnson Kulakundas Family Gallery. I sincerely appreciate all of the effort it took to support my exhibition proposal, from the tremendous work Inish did as register, making sure to support my exhibition proposal, from the way that she took care to make sure the works made it safely to the gallery, and, an and to further, um, the embodiment of an important aspect of my years of dissertation research on these four artists. At this point in time, I'd like to welcome Mary Schneider Enriquez to the virtual conversation, where she will also pose, pose questions from the audience. Thank you, Chastity. That was a great treat for all of us. And I think um, you have, have enticed those to um, make sure they come to the gallery and actually do the close looking that you've encouraged us to do. Uh, it is, I've had the great opportunity already to do that. So I know you have articulated exactly what excites me about it. And I'm sure that others will feel the same way. Um, I'm gonna do a, a few minutes. We're gonna have a, a discussion, um, 10 to 15 minutes, Chastity and I, but. After that, we'll open up for questions in the audience. So please post any questions you might have in the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen and we will get to those um, shortly. So Cassidy, I think I've had the pleasure of, of uh, knowing you as you've gone through this journey of, of research and, and, and shared your excitement and your incredible um, ideas from the work you've done. And it's, it's a pleasure to see it all come together both in your dissertation, but very particularly uh, in this exhibition. One of your central points that you repeated, and I think is very important, is looking at the, the kind of loose ends of abstraction in the late 60s, early 70s, and how these four artists materialize the line. Um, and, and you're very clear about how important that is to thinking about this moment in abstraction and the materialization of the line as it refers to body. And, as I looked at the works and have read your, your essay in the wonderful catalog, everyone will see. Um, one of the questions that really popped forth in my mind, and I'd love to have you unpack a little further, is the idea of the body and the materialized line 
and whether that really in some level is more about the labor than it is anything else. So it is the labor that was about Pindell gluing together the chats. It was the labor with Mildred's making these extraordinary lines and pounding these incredible you know, nails into the wood. Um, I'm not gonna give my own view on all of that. I'd love you to talk a little bit more about it and then end up with Marin because I wanna go back to Marin in particular and the idea of her own history, um, but please. Yeah, I think this is a great question because I think that what you're kind of focusing in on is what is super important at the end of the day to see these works as examples of leaving very obvious the trace of the labor. Um, and that that is revealed by what you see, but it is also very much revealed by this like drive to want to give the viewer a certain kind of haptic experience. So the, you know, one of the reasons why Liliana Porter's work is so like important and engaging to me is because it has this real um, conversation with, with Trumploy, a uh, history of Trumploy, where there is mm -hmm. this two dimensional image, but much of what is going on there is trying to fool the eye in ways that use that sense of touch, that that appeal to a sense of touch. Um, and I think it's a very important thing to kind of let that drive thoughts around the other works. So one of the points that I was trying to make is that with Mildred Thompson nailing those whip pieces, leaving those nails so prominent in the final composition, um, Howardine and Pendel leaving the gluing of those chads so prominent in the compositions. And, you know, it may seem very simple on its face, but it is super important to me to think about Pendel's works in particular as, you know, thinking about the trajectory, thinking about the early um, drawings um, and collage works vis-a-vis -vis the paintings, right? Where um, there's still that incredible, like tactile, like what, you know, she's referred to as surface tension in those paintings. But in these early works where she's numbering the chads and gluing them, she's leaving that glue and, you know, that kind of raw material, um, so prominent, you know, so much a part of that finished composition. And, um, especially upon close looking, um, you can't help but really pay so close attention to its the method of its making. And it's that juxtaposition. It's that 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 I was trying to set up, um, you know, in this brief talk, which is it's about maintaining that juxtaposition at all mm -hmm. times by mm -hmm. highlighting the nails, the glue, you know, the fasteners, the attach, the attachments. Mm -hmm. um, and so as you have so, I think, very um, thoughtfully done, you know, asked me to end on Marin and with respect to this question, you know, I, you know, Marin's work is the one that I think is just such a beautiful coda because in her, um, in many, you know, in, in doing the research on, on Marin and also you know, paying close attention to kind of some of the things that are maintained throughout her practice, um, this real thrust of a participatory, you know, part to her work, like, and again, it's a really important aspect that she doesn't, like, foreground that, right? Like, that's always, like, the, particip the participatory part is always very much, like, has to remain in tension with the fact that she's creating like a sculptural work, a sculptural, uh -huh. you know, work that is in conversation with, you know, modernism and abstraction and um, certainly like bearing the hallmarks um, and traces of her 
training at Bennington and, you know, I, this, this is a real effort I read on the part of her work to make a serious intervention in disallowing the viewer to forget that there is a body, like there is a movement going on um, and a continual gesture um, going on. And I love these prints with this example of, you know, her use of industrial wire rope because again, like a person who's really sitting with this work or thinking about the method of the making of the prints, what is a, ostensibly a two-dimensional work, is going to notice that, you know, it almost appears as if she's taken that wire rope and pressed it into the wood, right? Mm -hmm. In order to mm -hmm. that. Um, and I think there's something just so subtle and beautiful about reminding, you know, the viewer at every turn that, yes, this is an image to be consumed, an optical like experience for the eye and for the intellect, but it really never lets us forget about that repetitive gesture, um, that, that, that thing that they're doing to get there. Also uh, jumping in just for a moment, um, one of the things you make a point of uh, stating, which I, you didn't write yet, so I'm going to pull it out, is that she was, uh, Mary came from a history of dance as well. And this whole idea of movement to your point, but the performative quality to me is something very much in her work that in her larger works that aren't in your exhibition, you also have that sense of the engagement with the public or the, the viewer as you talk about it. Um, but also it links back to, um, they, they literally are three-dimensional, these extraordinary sculptures. And, and you, you point, you tease out this wonderful quote. I wonder if you'd talk about that, about line plus sculpture equals me, no? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in archival research on Marin, um, one of the real like moments where I was, you know, it, 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 it's one of those moments that you have in the archives where you realize that like you um, are like finding something kind of like halfway through the research period. And you're like, I almost really can't believe that this is here. <laughs> and um, she has these beautiful drawings, like which I, you know, for the longest time didn't know about um, that like early drawings of some of the early works, some of the works that you're referring to, like larger scale um, works. And, you know, I come across this list of, you know, basically like list of priorities, right, um, for, for Marin at the time. And um, I, I thought it was so like telling that, she was so focused on the line because it it's something that like I had seen before many, many times, like talking about like the the line, like drawing with the line, like the unraveling of the wire rope, you know, making this point of like the two dimensional, like a way of getting the line out into like out beyond the two dimensional into the three dimensional, like how to do that. And I was always trying to find a way to not like let their work ever become like didactic. And it was important to always make the point that what they're doing is they're trying to maintain attention, right? They're not, they're, the works are never so obvious on their face. Um, and I, I love that you pull this out because it is like, I still want you, it's almost as if those works are saying, you know, I still, I want you to pay attention to this body, right? This often evacuated body in abstraction. But I don't want you to ever lose sight that I'm making these formal statements. And that right there encompassed it perfectly, you know, line, like the the investigation of these formal method, you know, these formal elements of their methods of making, but that they recognized that it was impossible to 
sustain a practice that didn't hold both intention, right? Like a, mm -hmm. a real effort to make these formal innovative statements, but never like forget that there's a there's a laboring body behind that. There's a there's a laboring mm -hmm. subject. Um, mm -hmm. um, and not making those statements in a way that is, you know, screaming it, but mm -hmm. that that subtlety that I think they all are bringing to the work was something that I also thought was very important to sit with. Um, yeah. Uh, and jumping jumping from Marin to the others, as you refer to them, um, uh, the other fantastic artists in the show, Mildred Thompson, um, you started with and talking about the beautiful accordion book, which is so sensual and so body, but very much line, very much line as you talk about it. And then she goes, she she goes on as you show in your exhibition um, to do these works in wood which are clearly very muscularly created. I mean, you could not have done them simply, obviously. I mean, just she really worked hard physically to create them. So her body, you, you, you can't look at them and not know that body was very physically engaged in making this come to life. And I wonder if you would talk about those, but also talk about the print that you show by her, because it too has a kind of very robust physical presence and the way in which you created it, she created it, excuse me, speaks directly to what you're talking about as well. And I, I wonder if you'd unpack that a little more, little more so that when people come to the exhibition, they'll have a sense of Mildred's take on this as well, please. Yeah. And I, and I thank you for highlighting that because again, like that's one of the things about like taking a dissertation project, which is one thing and distilling it in many ways to an exhibition, but the exhibition has many super important parts is that like, how do I make sure that I kind of hit those points? Um, and I was always so interested in the exhibition context to do it in a way that didn't foreground my voice, but gave the viewers enough, you know, to know kind of what my thesis is and, you know, what I was trying to say, but to really kind of step back and give viewers like, you know, some latitude to, to bring what they will to it and, and interpret as they will. But I'm glad you point out that I certainly was incredibly like happy to be able to showcase the print works um, and construction, which is the one that you're referring to from circa 1973, that is next to the wood pictures, um, is a print that's made from Mildred cutting the printing plate, like, and, you know, manipulating that plate, like literally cutting that plate. Um, mm -hmm. And again, like this two-dimensional image that is the result of like so much, um, you know, tremendous labor, frankly, on her mm -hmm. part that mm -hmm. is again, maintaining this juxtaposition between a traditional etched line, right? Mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. Etched line with a burin mm -hmm. and like literally cutting the plate in order to create the image. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, just this, what I see as a real effort to make, you know, an abstract image, like one that stands on its own, but then that extra meaning that is brought by knowing, by thinking about the method of its making. And especially with Mildred, um, recognizing that she saw prints, you know, each print as an individual work of art. Mm -hmm. um, that's and I think that's, yeah, and I think that's very much like part of understanding that she, you know, in many ways understood that this was not about merely providing an abstract image. It was also about, you know, always remembering the trace of that, of that labor, um, what was going mm -hmm. into producing that, that image. Mm -hmm. um, and I want viewers, you know, I, I think it's a, a real delight for viewers to have the opportunity to notice things in the other works in the exhibition 
Um, but I certainly do do a little bit of pointing to the other works in the exhibition, which have embossed lines where Mildred mm -hmm. has once again, mm -hmm. you know, manipulated the plate before printing in a very uh, specific way. Mm -hmm. um, but to provide viewers with that, you know, those further examples of, of uh, Mildred's practice was, was very important to me. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. you also, no, of course. Um, another question that I, I think seems like an obvious to bring up, and I know you and I have talked about this over the years, quite literally, is um, the fact that the the artists you've chosen are all women, and that they you you know you you talk about the importance that they chose everyday materials, but so much of what they're doing is about using the hand. One word you used years ago and continues to stick in my head is the idea of fastening and connecting and the idea of um, mending and sewing and building and but connection. And you talked about, and, and, and I don't mean to oversimplify this by any means, but the role of a female artist doing these different tasks using those particular means to create a work of art with everyday materials. What is your perspective on that? What would you say to the, the audience about your choices and how you look at that? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we have, you know, you and I have, have talked about multiple times and I, and I really thank you for um, presenting it here in, in this particular way, because it's something that's so vitally important to my project um, it has always been been vitally important to my research questions is, you know, why do I put them together, right? <laughs> and I've done such a, um, like I've tried so hard to make sure that it's been about what they do, right? Like yeah. what, like how, especially in this exhibition, right, that like, it's about how they materialize the line. Yep. Uh, but, right, obviously, there's three African-American women artists. There's one artist from Argentina who relocated to the New York City in 1964. Um, you know, they are all women. They are all women of color artists and they are carrying with them a history of particular types of movements within these broader art movements, within this broader story of, of art history. And I think for me, it was vitally important to maintain as much as I could, like this tension that I think sometimes people have when they like encounter my work and it's not necessarily like, the first thing I talk about, but it's certainly there, right? Like how, like, how do you, like, it's, it's this question that so many scholars before me have grappled with, like, how do you talk about a, a sphere of production that is about, you know, evacuating, like the representational image, um, but, it still seems so very much about representing something, right? Um, and that's what's so exciting about this work is that I think it does that. I think it maintains those subtle distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's in those juxtapositions where some of you know, the most generative questions can be asked um, and we can make attempts to answer them. Um, so I don't know if that totally answers your question, but. No, I think it does a great job. Thank you. I'm gonna, we have so many questions that I might open. I'm gonna open it up now and um, begin to share some of the audience's questions with you, Chastity, if I may. Um, one question is, since we were just talking about Mildred and her practice, I think I'm gonna go for, um, follow up on this with, a question was asked about Mildred's watercolor wood work. And if you might, Explain a little more about her distinctive use of color in contrast in this particular work to her monochromatic wood pictures. 
What do you think she was approaching with the introduction of color? Are there examples, evidence of this continued experimentation in her sculptural works? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Thank you, because it gives me another opportunity. I, I briefly nodded to it um, during the talk, but Mildred does. Uh, Mildred used a lot of color <laughs> in the wood pictures and paintings, <laughs> um, in the watercolor. Um, and um, I cannot say enough how like happy I was to be able to include that piece for that reason. Uh -huh. um, and I think it's super important to understand that for my research, like thinking about um, like Mildred's practice, like I'm thinking about kind of the, the long span of Mildred's practice, like it is like the, the, the moves that she's making, like going to this more monochromatic work that I see like in the, the mid 1970s with the wood pictures um, is a distinct period that like is one period in time, but there are a number of wood pictures that come before that have, you know, just engaging with all kinds of um, like moves within like color um, and also super importantly, like she um, in earlier wood pictures tends to um, like use um, more like shadow and um, like, I mean, you'll notice in um, earlier wood pictures where she has like protrusions from the surface where she's providing like additional texture um, and movement um, with, you know, sometimes they're more monochromatic, but sometimes like they have color. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the amazing examples, like earlier examples of um, works that I refer to, um, which are like painted white, they have actual like clothes pins in them too, right? So they're providing like additional texture and additional movement in that way as well. Um, and again, to circle back to the watercolor, like one of the points that I was trying to make with that, and I found this amazing quote in a letter that she wrote to James Porter about how she thought it would be amazing to show those that wa those watercolors with the wood pictures because she was so interested in playing with shadows like and mm -hmm. i and i said you know that is really like amazing like she's using like wet upon dried like watercolor strokes to you know, create these two-dimensional representations of the whip mm -hmm. pictures, the interstices. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's so attuned to the ways in which that materialized line, mm -hmm. you know, is registering to the eye. Like I, you know, I, I think that's like, it's a very, it's a very important question. And, um, you know, I think in the future, it'd be, you know, great to see again, like, you know, a broader span of her work in the wood pictures and all of the, you know, wonderful things that she's doing with movement and color. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's one of the reasons that I was super happy to include the watercolor and I'm super happy to hear somebody pull that out for that reason. So thank you for that question. Mm. Another uh, another question that, that diverges slightly but builds on some of these ideas you've just discussed. Um, the comment is made that several of the works in the show, uh, Stitch, Hook, Hassinger's piece, et cetera, seem to be in conversation with a fiber arts and crafts tradition that has dis historically been women's work. While Mildred Thompson's wood pictures evoke a traditionally masculine realm of labor. <clears throat> As we think about this method of making, are we also being invited to think about ways in which we impose gender on labor? And both I would pull out of this, the idea both of fiber works and wood works. And is there is there something for you to add to that? 
Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Um, oh, so the whip pictures. Um, there are so many touch points, right? So um, to talk about like her relationship with Lord again, like there's um, writing, you know, on biographical writing on Lord that mentions like, you know, her relationship with Mildred and like talking about, you know, seeing Mildred like work, work with the wood. And then there's also like Mildred, like talking about how woodworkers would come by her studio in Tampa. Um, and they were so amazed by the way she was able to work with the materials and how, you know, this great facility that she had um, with working with the wood, you know, and, um, you know, there's certainly that, you know, sometimes kind of said, but sometimes a little bit unsaid, you know, mm -hmm. assumption that she's not going to know what she's doing with wood, right? You know, and I I think that um, one of the things that I have considered a lot about her work in wood, and this is partly because in earlier shows, there were some of the wood pictures were named after like, you know, like, a wood floor, you know, had some some references to those things. Like there's there is really a a place that I think really needs to be examined about how much Mildred is thinking about like where the wood is coming from, right? Mm -hmm. And I I think that there I, I nodded to it in the talk, but I think there's a lot more work to be done to think about how these artists are, you know, they're concerned with the methods of making, they're thinking about leaving the trace of that labor, but they are also aware of the, you know, associations that are gonna come from using industrial wire rope, right? <laughs> like, I mean, this, um, it's steel, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yarn mm -hmm. is used for particular types of things, right? Right, um, right. You know, um, yeah. wood, like, the, like Mildred's pieces, you know, do evoke this idea of like a wood floor in a home, right? So they, again, mm -hmm. like it is this particular kind of like work, right? That it may at times be associated with a masculine kind type of work, mm -hmm. but it is also like something that is, you know, has its ties to the domestic, has its ties to, you know, romantic notions of place too, right? And I, mm -hmm. I think that that's something that is super important to recognize as well. And it's, it also comes up right in Howard Dean Pendel's work. Like this is a, you know, the the type of like materials that she's using, manila paper, you know, graphing paper, like all of those materials like have, you know, rich historical resonance. Like they they have personal historical re relevance mm -hmm. for Pendel. Mm -hmm. Her father was mm -hmm. a mathematician and, you know, and she also talks about, you know, the architectural students at Yale using graphing paper, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's also there. Yes. Yes. The answer to the question is, is an emphatic yes. Like there are those really generative questions that can be examined about the ways in which these artists are attuned to these materials and how they're tied to gender. Mm -hmm. uh, but once again, I keep on going back to, they're doing it very subtly, right? Mm -hmm. Like look at the other historical examples of the ways that these materials are being used mm -hmm. and think about how subtly, how much they can easily sit in that liminal space. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what's particularly important to me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we have time for one more question. I'm gonna combine two questions. One is, how much you look at in the case of Mildred, her own uh, personal context, the role of place, and, and particularly you referred to Jacksonville and how important that context was to her work. 
And then another question relating to Mildred's time in Germany and the idea of that time and how much the experience there and the quotidian from that world was a part that she brought into her work. And, and we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to force you to be a little concise. Apologies, but thank well, you. Well, I'll, I'll try to be as concise as I can. Um, that's <laughs> a great question. Say that first. Um, so I've already talked a little bit about, about Jacksonville and I, and, um, and also, I mean, Mildred has wonderful autobiographical writings about like her beginnings and like when she was a child, like first like making artwork. Um, and so she and she was thinking at the time she sent it to Audre Lorde, this biographical writing about the influence of women in her life and these beautiful meditations about like her mom's support, like early support. Um, in this trajectory. And so certainly there is something very like um, that that Mildred is is very much like attuned to. Like in the letters when she's when she's moved back to Tampa and she's writing Audre Lorde, like she's she's very much thinking about like being back in the United States, being back in Florida, and the use of this spruce and you know, like getting a a a, a shipment of spruce, you know, to make like she's she makes whip pictures, but she also makes like standing sculptures too. So but um, so there is, yes, certainly something there. But on the German, on the um, time in Germany question, really great question. She does use, she does, um, she is attuned to using materials in the place in which she is. So when she first starts making whip pictures in New York City early on in the 1960s, she's using like grocery grocery crates uh found wood you know from grocery crates and um and like she has you know writings about that like she's she's certainly thinking about where these materials are coming from like and um i think that is something that i i think her work and howardina's um in particular speak to so like um directly in this exhibition but again once we take a closer look and we look at Marin with the wire rope and the way that she that she first encountered that material like there is definitely like a very rich uh thread that's running throughout all of their works I would argue um but certainly that's a I mean very important question about Mildred's works um uh, as well. So yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. Well, there is a lot more you can discuss. And I know, I mean, everybody wants to hear it, but unfortunately we have to draw the, the afternoon to a close. And I, I first and foremost would like to thank you, Chastity, for a really, really wonderful um, presentation of your show, of, of what you're doing in your thesis and what people will be able to read and see when they go to the exhibition. Um, your work is so important. I've said that from day one, and it is a great pleasure for me to share this moment with you to, to show it to the world. So uh, thank you. Thank you. I, no, no, my total pleasure. Um, and then I'm, I'm supposed to add some, some fun facts for everybody. Registration to visit a female landscape in the abstract gesture exhibition in the Family Gallery at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute is open and can be accessed through the Radcliffe website radcliffe.harvard.edu. The exhibition is free and open to the public Monday through Friday, noon to 4.30 p.m. from now on through June 22nd, 2024. Advanced registration is encouraged before visiting Radcliffe exhibitions. Finally, today's program has been recorded and will be posted in about a week, but for information about upcoming Radcliffe programs and exhibitions and to see videos of past events, please visit radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and take good care.